Good evening, everyone. It is 6 p.m. here in Chicago, Illinois, where I am joined by the lovely Carolyn Skiba and Mary Morgan Ryan. We're going to have a great evening tonight talking about their project, If You Learned Here. Um, and But first, we have to take care of some business. Um, my name is Lucy Gray, and I am the co-chair of this conference, and this is our third keynote tonight. We're really excited to have uh, Carolyn and Mary with us tonight and hope that you will enjoy the presentation as well. We'd like to thank our sponsors and our supporters, including BIF International Education, TEZ, the Global Campaign for Education, United States Chapter, Iron USA, and Otis, amongst many others. Please uh, make sure to check out the sessions that each of these sponsors are hosting this week and their resources. TEZ is also interested in having people upload their content from various presentations, and we will be sending information about that um, down the road. So thanks again to our sponsors and supporters who have been so generous and kind and supportive of our work. I'm going to give you guys the ability now to uh, use the tools to the left of your whiteboard, and you're going to use the little asterisk star tool to indicate where you are in the world. Um, I'm going to put my little star where I think I am. At this point, I, it may be, who knows where I am. Uh, but you can, we can see where everybody is, is uh, located in the world tonight. Looks like we've got a few people on the west coast and east coast of the United States. Someone in Africa, that's wonderful. We're glad you're here. And in the chat, can you please uh, indicate your actual location, your, your, so we know what city and country you're in? I'm in, actually, Northbrook, Illinois. I see we have a lot, North, North Carolina, Los Angeles, Alabama, Mexico. All right. New Hampshire, Virginia, New Jersey. Charlottesville, Deerfield. All right, you're right down the street from me, Bonnie. It's great to have you all here. Uh, Carolyn is, um, I'll give you guys a few minutes here to add your little dots where you are. I guess somebody's not in Africa anymore. I don't see a dot there. Uh, but I'm going to start introducing these wonderful presenters. Carolyn Skiba is an Apple Distinguished Educator and a friend of mine. She teaches at Burley School in Chicago, and uh, her school is also an Apple Distinguished School. Mary is in Hinsdale, Illinois. At, are you at Clarendon Middle School, Mary? I should know this. I'm at Oak School, an elementary Oak school. school. I should know that. You're at, you're at an elementary school called Oak School, and your school district is also an Apple Distinguished School District, correct? Yes. Okay. So I met I met Mary Morgan at uh, a gathering uh, for Apple Distinguished Schools, and so did, and Carolyn was there, and I think that's where they they founded the project. So great things happen with those schools who are innovating, and hopefully they'll tell you a little bit more about that program in the course of things tonight. Earlier today we had another keynote by Ned Kirsch who is a superintendent of a rural school district in Vermont, and his school, incidentally, is also an Apple Distinguished School. This, um, this is a program that innovative schools are, are recognized in, and um, there's a lot to learn from them, I think, in my opinion. So without further ado, I want to hear from you and not from me. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to you guys and um, let me know if I can help. I'll be here to moderate questions and help you along. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks, Lucy. So, so we are so excited to be here. Um, my name is Mary uh, Morgan Ryan, and um, I'm a teacher librarian, school librarian at a pre-K to five um, elementary school in the western suburbs of Chicago. And Carolyn, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Sure. Well, um, again, welcome everyone. It's so nice to be here to share a project that, as Lucy said, began when Mary and I uh, connected with one another through the Apple Distinguished Schools. Apple Distinguished Program uh, Recognition Program, and we'll talk a little bit more about how the project came to be in just a few minutes. Um, but I am the Technology Specialist at Burley School, which is a Chicago public school on the north side, 
And um, take it away, Mary. Let's talk a little bit about this adventure we've had together. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, we like to say we've done this. We have met in person twice now. So um, we, uh, we've done all of this collaboration as if we were across the country. All right, I am trying the web tour, and I'm trying to put my YouTube URL in there, but it's not behaving very well for me. Carolyn, you want to see if you can get the web tour to, to go for you? I sure will. All right, so this project, um, we call it If You Learned Here, and we encourage you to go to our um, project website, ifyoulearnedhere.weebly.com. Um, you can tour, tour around as we're um, speaking, and also please feel free to ask us any questions. We had um, 70 schools from over 20 countries work with us last spring um, on a four-week collaboration and sharing project, which then was followed by um, a period of writing and publishing, and um, we, so we shared with each other and got to know each other, and then we all wrote a global ebook together as our culminating project. So what you're seeing right now is some beautiful images of children around the world who participated in um, the project, and we got to know each other and each other's cultures and schools as we went along through our four weeks. And then, um, as we said, we. Um, wrote an ebook together and I think, oh, well this is um, a digital bulletin board that um, is run on Padlet. And so you can also see some wonderful images of children. This one is sharing their um, school life together with each other. So then we need to load in the one of the video number two. I think you're doing better at so it. So we're hoping to, Carolyn. well we'll see if we can get this working here. We apologize. Yeah. There's some, uh, flaws in the system, we're trying to meet the bandwidth needs of everybody around the world. So we wanted to just give you a quick tour of the different elements of our program and to give you a glimpse into the beautiful book that students created as you're seeing a page through that right now. And really um, share with you, again, just some of the rich media that was collected and shared by these 76 schools around the world um, that really brought kids together, I think, in some really interesting and powerful ways. And one of the things that we're most excited to share with you today is the fact that this project is really something that um, for us brought together a lot of student curiosity. And so kids who have questions about what it's like to go to school other places and what it's like to be a student in different parts of the world had that opportunity to explore that curiosity through this project. And of course, bringing together um, meaningful global connections through technology is what this conference is all about, and it's really what this project was all about. And we also wanted to make sure that students had the opportunity to be creative and to publish something authentic with one another. And we really feel, Mary and I do as a team, and I know all of you do as well, that's why you've joined us tonight, is that when kids are able to use their curiosity and creativity to connect meaningfully around the world, that's what leads to kids caring more about different parts of the world, about other people around the world, and really being able to engage in a thoughtful kind of way with global issues, global questions, and just their own perception of difference even, and um, their understanding of maybe things they see on the news. And so we really firmly believe that having this opportunity for kids is a great first step toward building that kind of caring and togetherness around the world. And of course, it's not just enough to bring people together to chit chat. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we had a thoughtful structure behind that. Right, so every project, whether it's a global project or just within your school, um, has some features that um, get it going. And so this is how we wanted to sort of structure our talk with you tonight, is the different parts of our project, um, what inspired us, why we decided to go forward with it, how we structured it, and then the tools that we used to help people uh, collaborate. So the, um, the idea, as Lucy was saying at the beginning, um, the idea came to us when we met at an Apple Distinguished Schools um, professional development event. And um, I had seen Carolyn do a global uh, presentation about a global project, and I knew who she was. And I had done um, a global a collaboration project on my own, but I was unhappy with um, time zones and how they got in my way, and I knew I wanted to have a partner to um, 
boost my skills in the whole global collaboration effort. And so we, we got together and started talking and um, our inspiration turned out to be, of all things, a print book. <laughs> And this is actually something I, I hear you laughing, Mary, and I think a lot of people laugh when, you know, we look at we're, we're from schools that are very, um, very rich in technology, very, I think, thoughtful about the way that we use technology with kids. And but both of our schools retain a great love of literature, a great love of reading and the power of books to really illuminate ideas for kids and spark a lot of thoughtful questioning. And so as Mary and I talked together and said, well, we want to do something global. We're not sure what it's going to look like. We came across this incredible book, um, If You Live Here, Houses of the World, by Giles LaRoche. And what we loved about this book, um, several things. First of all, the visuals are so incredibly captivating and beautiful. These are all done with cut paper. But they also, the book followed a really simple and compelling format. And so it started off with some text about if you lived here, what your life would be like. It talked about the type of house, the materials used to build the house. Um, it also just, I think, really presented an, uh, an incredible visual window and for, for kids into thinking about what it's like to live in different parts of the world and under different circumstances. And so we looked at this book together and we said, wow, is this something we could do? Could we create something like this, a similar resource like this about schools around the world? And as we're doing that, how could we facilitate discussion and conversation so that students could learn about other cultures, countries, and schools along the way to publishing this finished piece together. Right, so we wanted to create a project that um, was manageable and um, easy for teachers. We'll get to that in a moment, easy for teachers to fit into our already busy schedule. Um, but as Carolyn said, we wanted to make sure that our, our students had an opportunity for global dialogue. Um, really had that opportunity to go to school and talk to or hear from um, people in other countries and learn about their cultures and how their school days are um, are structured. And we really wanted to focus on reading and writing. We wanted um, our students to get a chance to do some authentic writing for um, a global audience. And as Carolyn has um, mentioned before, we really wanted to make sure that um, we gave kids an opportunity to um, boost their cultural awareness. We thought really long and hard about the structure because Carolyn and I are both classroom practitioners. We are in um, buildings with students and um, we, you know, we live the time constraints uh, day to day. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that what we came up with was something that would be um, friendly to the school day that people are, are operating within. So we thought about the structure in a couple different ways. And so, so as, um, as Mary's saying, we wanted it to be so manageable, but we also knew we wanted a lot of countries involved. And so we said, okay, how are we going to do this? Mary mentioned earlier that time zones can be such a challenge. Language barriers can be an issue. Different platforms and different types of technology available. And so we thought about this as a continuum and thought about the fact that, okay, on the one hand, with a collaboration, you might have a small project where you're collaborating one-on-one -on -one or with small groups of classrooms versus on our end, the if you learned here end, we wanted it to be more large scale. We wanted many countries and schools to be able to participate in this collaborative you know what, opportunity. Carolyn, just, we also it just strikes me while you're saying that, that, that is the, the, um, the smaller project is what both of us had tried and, uh, and succeeded at before we met each other. Absolutely, and I think I had been part of some other projects that were large that um, we kind of struggled with some organizational aspects and so we knew we didn't want to go that way. Um, right. And we knew that as we, um, you know, again, as we thought through this continuum, when you're doing those small projects, and again, this is, we love the small projects and feel that those can be really a great way to have some ongoing open-ended sharing with just a couple of partners. But since our project was going to be larger, we felt like we were going to really need our, our sharing to have structure to it. And we wanted it to have a fixed duration so that it would fit in with people's busy classroom schedules. On the one end, you can have face-to-face -face synchronous sharing. So again, when you've got just one classroom partner or a couple, it's easy to coordinate those Skypes. It's easy to coordinate those Google Hangouts um, or those FaceTimes or whatever live synchronous method you'd like. But we knew that was not going to work for us. We didn't want to be juggling time zones and figuring out ways for kids to come to school early 
or stay late. And so we said, we want this to be an asynchronous project. We want people to be able to access their, their partner's media, but also to make their own contributions as it fit their own schedules. And so again, one of the trade-offs with that is that with the smaller projects, you end up with a lot of depth with those relationships with those one or two partner schools. But on the end of our project, we were really going for breadth. We wanted to have many different countries and many different perspectives. Now, that doesn't mean that kids weren't wondering about deep questions and deep issues, but our relationship with the individual schools was, was less detailed than it would be with the smaller collaboration. So we just wanted to put that in context a little bit because as we worked on it, we realized that we were really firmly with this project at one end of the spectrum, and that we also learned a lot about what it takes to put together a broad, larger scale project like this, as opposed to the more informal sharing that we had done previously. So when we had decided that that's what we wanted to do, sort of a larger scale project, um, we started thinking about how we wanted that time frame to, to look. So we decided we really wanted to give our teachers a chance to um, try some tools and meet each other before we got students involved. So we did, uh, we had a week zero where we focused on teacher using, teachers using the tools and teachers networking with each other. And then we moved into uh, four weeks of what we call explore and share. And those weeks involved a theme each week where each school would be able to respond to a particular question or talk about a particular theme. We wrapped it up with um, three weeks of writing and publishing. As we mentioned, we um, got together and wrote and published a global ebook. And finally, we had a week where everybody was reading the ebook and we had um, a chance to reflect and celebrate our work together. So we decided that we would wanted to let people know what the the sort of basic expectations um, that we would have for a school that was participating. But we also knew that some people would want to go beyond. So we we um, labeled our, uh, activities the basics and beyond. So each week we gave each school a chance to um, give one response about our theme. And we asked each school to donate or to be able to commit one hour a week to um, watching the media, listening to the media, reading um, the submissions of other schools. Because it was more than, more than just you submitting. You, you needed to um, be able to watch and respond to what other people were submitting as well. So each week for the first four weeks, each school submitted one Flipgrid response, and we're going to talk about the tools in a little bit, which is a um, video discussion response. And then um, the basics during writing and publishing were um, creating your school's pages for our ebook. And then we did one final Flipgrid response, a video response for um, our Reflect and Celebrate week. So if those are the there. basics. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, and before we go beyond, I think it might be worth yeah. noting, I can't remember if we are talking about this again later or not, but I think it's so important to acknowledge the fact that this was a little bit of a frustration, I think, for some participants. Because again, what we're asking is one response per school. And so imagine you've got, um, so in my school, uh, all the fifth graders were participating. Well, you know that every fifth grader wants to be on that video, and every fifth grader wants to have his or her voice heard. And so we really, I don't know, if, I, I wouldn't say we, we struggled with this because we knew that we didn't want to overwhelm the audience with too much media. We also didn't want kids to put their heart and soul into creating media that was so extensive and there was so much of it that it would never get an audience. It wouldn't get viewed. And so we really were serious about the, the one response per school. And when Mary walks us through some of the Flipgrid examples later, you'll see how schools tackled that really successfully. But going into a project, I think oftentimes it's, it's, um, it's something to navigate with your students about what's our role and what's our participation and how are individual students going to be able to feel connected to this project. And I think part of that comes in the beyond piece, but I just wanted to mention that we had some, um, some real conversations about that, I think. Well, we had conversations about that with our students. We also had conversations about that with our participants because on a slightly larger scale, Carolyn, we had people, um, a school who would participate and they wanted their second grade to participate and their third grade to participate and their fourth grade to participate 
um, and that kind of thing. So we had to have sort of that same conversation on a, um, a little on a participant level um, for the exact same reasons, that we really only wanted one response from, say, in my case, uh, Hinsdale, Illinois, to show the school building and the culture. Um, and we didn't want to, um, as you said, have so much media that it was hard to wade through. So good point. So if you were willing to do, uh, if your school was able and willing to do one Flipgrid response per week and um, create book creator pages, then you, um, you know, were a perfect model participant. But if you really want to do more, um, then we wanted to have some tools that would allow for, as Carolyn said, multiple responses per classroom. And so for, in that uh, regard, we created um, Padlets, which are digital bulletin boards, and we're going to be showing you some of that later on. And those were open for whatever content and as much content as people wanted to post to them. Um, and so we um, were able to take in that um, enthusiasm and allow some extra posting, but people weren't committed to necessarily watching or absorbing all that content. And so then, you know, again, we were really trying to differentiate for how much people wanted to put into this. And so everyone did the flip grids. People who wanted to added to the Padlets. And then there were people who really wanted to go even further. And so we offered teachers a private teacher directory of participants so that if they said, wow, I really want to go more in depth talking with that school in Romania or that school in Bahrain or whatever it was, that they could arrange those connections on their own. We certainly wanted to open the door to that. Um, but we didn't want to require it or expect it in any way. And so one other piece we added to make sure that everyone had an audience was to split project participants into cohorts. As our registration grew and grew, and I did see a question earlier in the chat about recruitment, uh, we recruited largely through Twitter and through our own professional contacts. For example, Mary has um, some connections in the international librarian community, and I was able to reach out to some Apple Distinguished Educators and ask them to um, to share the project through their network. So we really kind of did a lot of word of mouth and a lot of Twitter promotion. But 76, all of a sudden we said, wow, this is thrilling and also a little terrifying. And we're picturing 76 Flipgrid videos that are 90 seconds in length. No one's going to have the time to watch that in their school day. So what we did is we split our participants into cohorts. And because we really believe that everyone needs an audience, and we wanted to be very serious about not having this project spill over to the point where it felt unwieldy, it felt frustrating, and it felt unattainable for classroom teachers. We also wanted to make sure that everyone was able to view content with some geographic diversity, and so we split up the cohort to ensure that um, everybody had as much representation around the globe as possible. Now, that doesn't mean that they could watch. Lucy just posted a question in the chat, did we limit the number of schools? So the answer is no, we did not. Um, but that's the reason we went to cohorts, to keep it manageable um, as far as what you, you know, the, the schools that you were going to connect with. Absolutely. And so the, the way the cohorts worked is that we had the participants posting within their cohort. So there was one space for the red cohort, one for orange, one for yellow, and so on. And the expectation was, you're posting to those that cluster of schools, and you're going to watch everything in that cohort of schools. You can watch anything else you want. It's all public. Anyone who wants to watch it can go watch it. It's all still online there um, for people to go and, and take a look at on our If You Learn Here website. Um, the URL is right there at the bottom, and I know Lucy's been putting it into the chat periodically. Um, but we wanted everyone to make sure that they were able to have that audience and um, contribute in a way that would be meaningful and would be viewed. We also wanted to organize our Explore and Share section, that four-week section, into different themes. And so these were the four themes we started with. In the first week, we had everyone sharing about our schools and communities, telling people a little bit about our schools, about where we live, talking in the second week a bit about our school day. In our third week, we really wanted to shift from getting to know each other to actually being teachers of one another and having the opportunity to share some expertise and knowledge on a global scale. And we had students who played music for one another. We had students demonstrating science experiments and math problems and all sorts of things, or just taking a tour of their learning day and showing snippets from different parts of their day. Then in week four, we focused on reading, where we asked students to go and to share 
their love of books and book recommendations with other kids around the world. In order to keep the project kind of glued together, we use our um, If You Learned Here hashtag, which I invite anyone um, who would like to join our project or talk about our project to join us there. We also, our, our project website was really the hub for our blog with our updates to participants, tutorials, etc. And we did send out email updates as well because we want to make sure the information went straight to the participants, not that they had to keep going to look for it and wonder when there were updates coming along the way. All right, so our tools. Um, so as you've probably already gathered, um, we really wanted this to be an engaging, meaningful, and personal, but also a very manageable experience for the kids in the schools. And so we wanted our tools to allow kids to see each other's faces and hear each other's voices. We really wanted there to be some shared authorship and kids producing something meaningful together. We wanted there to be a rich variety of perspectives. We wanted to make sure that kids could hear from a lot of people in a manageable amount of time. And it was especially critical, we want to make sure that there is a low barrier to participation. That goes for cost. So Flipgrid costs money for us, but it's free for participants to go and post their videos. The other tools are free. And really, all a school would need to participate in this meaningfully would be a single iPad. And so, and there are other types of opportunities. You know, we had a couple schools that had, didn't have access to iPads and wanted to submit media other ways. We wanted to make sure that if you could get online and you could access these free tools, that you could be a part of our project. And then, um, as you already heard from our project structure, we wanted the project to be flexible. We said, okay, here are the basics. We need everyone to do this for this project to work. But hey, if you want to go further with it, the sky's really the limit. If all of your kids want to post um, a photo and you make a collage and put it on a Padlet, go right ahead. So that that way schools who really needed to engage every student on an individual level would have the time and the space to do that. So here are our three winning tools. Let's talk about those a little bit, Mary. Right, so we came up with um, our framework and we decided, um, as Carolyn said, it was really important to us to have um, schools participate who um, might really truly only have access to one device. Um, and so I was, I was out on Twitter and I was learning about Flipgrid and um, Flipgrid had a contest where if you tweeted out a creative way that you wanted to use Flipgrid, um, they would award you with a free account for a year. So of course, I had a great idea. I haven't used it yet, but I had a great idea. And um, I tweeted out and um, I won one of the free accounts for the year. So when I met Carolyn at that uh, Apple Distinguished Schools event, um, I sort of had that in my back pocket. What Flipgrid does is um, it provides an asynchronous way for students in a class to have a discussion. Um, the idea is that you, um, have a, you have a tool that allows people to submit video responses to questions that the teacher poses. So um, I don't know if you remember in the beginning we showed you the video where we were kind of sliding across. Can we stop that? I thought I did, and it's not stopping. I sincerely okay. apologize. <laughs> So let's I listen. Think, okay. I was trying to get it ready because sometimes it takes a minute to load and then it kind Don't of... Don't worry. Jumps again. All right. Let's listen to some of our little Flipgrid buddies here. All right. So that was um, a Flipgrid response. And what Flipgrid does is it's a pay, like um, we were saying, it's a paid um, tool, but only paid on the on the teacher end or on the facilitator end. So um, none of your students or your participants have to pay. And what it does is it limits your video response to 90 seconds. And it works best as a as an individual respondent uh, person where it's meant to be sitting at an iPad or sitting at a laptop with a webcam. Um, but as you saw, people got really creative with the way that they did their 90 seconds. So that was the tool that we used um, as our primary means of communication. What we would do is we would pose a question every week and every school would submit their answer in 90 seconds. So that was a really manageable amount of media to go through. You and then, did you want yeah, to go ahead. I'd love to. Is it time to do that? I think so let's do, do that. Okay, do so um, the video you just... Friends in the project, so. <laughs> 
The video you just saw was a week one video, and it was some students from Korea, and they were telling us about their um, their school and their community. They were talking about the different languages that they that they speak in their school. And the reason I chose that is uh, that that video um, to share was because it shows that sort of um, the way that people kind of hacked Flipgrid a little bit and, and <laughs> had groups present um, instead of just an individual. So now I'm going to show you this. Let's see, this is also week one. This is a school from uh, Transylvania. So that was um, another school for week one. Just and they're all they're doing is introducing us to them, uh, and they're telling about their school mascot. Um, those that school in Romania really wanted everyone to know that not everyone is a vampire who lives in Romania or Transylvania. This next video is another Flipgrid response. This one is, let's see if this one's going to work, invalid URL. Let's see what happened there. Oh, I got a space before. I have it too if you need it. There we go. So this is week two. So that was um, chosen to show you that um, that those kind of videos where people took us physically around their school, they really sparked so much curiosity and so many questions um, about uniforms that students were wearing, accents, um, and also the fact that they get to eat lunch outside every day. Um, just something that small really makes a difference. So I have two more. I, I want to add on to that about Go the ahead. video from Ro Romania, although I know the video might start playing magically at any second. But <laughs> the video from Romania is was was so fascinating for my students because they heard this elaborate introduction of the kids saying the name of their school in three different languages. And just to process that and for them to say, wait, so those kids have to know all of those different languages? They speak Hungarian, but they live in Romania. Why would that be? The kind of questions generated by this, and this is what we heard from participants all over the world, is that kids would pick up on different details and notice different things. They would inspire so much curiosity and so much questioning. And if anyone out there uses a lot of inquiry in their classroom, this kind of source material to spark and inspire questioning is really rich beyond comparison because it's authentic to the kids. They know that they, in their school, have shared responses to these same questions. And to hear the questions through the lenses of, of other, other kids in places that are so, so different, and to really reflect on their own school, but also to open up questioning about these other schools, it was really pretty powerful and exciting. It was. Um, it, it really was. And as you've seen, a lot of schools chose to have um, a, a group of students sort of give you bits and pieces. And this school uh, was week three when they were teaching us or showing us something that they were learning. So that video, uh, it, clearly, we're on week three at that point. And you can tell that people have gotten really savvy about speaking up loudly and clearly. 
um, and being creative in what they want to share. The theme that week was show us something you're learning. So people realized it didn't all have to be reading and writing and, and math. You know, there we were learning about um, some music. And then the last week, as Carolyn said, our theme was reading. And so um, to my mind, this was the best use of Flipgrid as far as what it was intended to do. We had students give individual book reviews. And here's a sample. So what we loved about that one uh, was that it does show one individual child um, sharing with the world. It's clearly unrehearsed. Um, she's really just sharing her thoughts about the book. And um, we just love that as an example of easy global sharing. So Carolyn, you want to talk about Padlet? Oh, yes. All right. So Padlet is, I'm sure many of you out there know about Padlet, have used it for various things in your classroom, but I just cannot say enough about Padlet in terms of offering, uh, I hate to say it this way, but offering overflow for sort of the energy of project participants. Because people, as we've said several times, people really want to, to share. We all feel that urge, the kids feel that, that need to be able to say, hey, I went out and took a photo and everyone around the world saw it. So the flip grids were very efficient, um, very condensed, but they allowed the audience to browse through a lot in a short amount of time. Padlets are where we offered some wiggle room and some open space for people to share additional media. And we had schools who posted videos on the Flipgrid and on the Padlets, photos, photo collages, links to documents, a lot of different kinds of things. And so this is just a sample of one of our Padlets. This was um, during week one. So week one, if you remember, our theme was our schools and communities. And so we offered, I think it was five different Padlets. You can find them all on our website. But the first one was just take a picture outside your window and tell us what you see. And so again, to get that visual literacy piece into your kids' lives, to make something that was really attainable, but also a very rich source of curiosity and questioning. So here was the picture that they took at um, one of the schools in New Zealand. We were fortunate to have many uh, New Zealand participants. Um, but you can see them in their shorts and their outdoor courtyard. And we had this fine post from Wisconsin, so a little closer to home for us here in Illinois, um, looking out the window at the snow and at the pumpkin patch. Um, this was uh, Jackie Friends, her school. She was um, a very enthusiastic participant in our project and is returning again this year. And um, the school in Bahrain, so pictures outside their window. Kids noticed the gate on the entrance to the school. They noticed how bright and sunny and warm it appeared to be outside. And again, just these simple photos that really spurred a lot of questioning. Um, I see, oh, okay, I was going to say I was looking at the chat. I didn't know if that was a question or a comment, but I enjoy reading everybody's uh, comments in there. All right, and then bringing it all together with Book Creator. So Book Creator, um, we, people were able to use the free version. Um, I use Book Creator so much at school. We are a one-to-one -one iPad school, and this is such an amazing publishing platform for students. And the best part about using Book Creator for a collaborative project is that it's very, very easy to combine pages from multiple authors into one finished, finished publication. And so Book Creator was absolutely a natural choice for us. Um, we were very structured as we worked the rest of the project in terms of the publishing. So we created a template that was patterned after our mentor text, If You Lived Here, by Giles LaRoche. And we wanted to make sure that we were including the same components that he included about home in our book about schools. And so, again, this wasn't a space where we were inviting people to put in a lot of media, a lot of videos, a lot of photos. We used the Padlet for that. What we really wanted was for people to use this template and create a page that would really have that kind of simplicity and predictable format to allow people to read it and enjoy it and be able to compare schools around the world. And so we provided people with a template and some pretty specific instructions about how to share their thinking and their um, 
their information about their school in order to create this book. And so those are our tools. That's pretty much, we're going to wrap up. Mary's got a couple of comments here, and then we will definitely open it up for questions. Absolutely. So uh, that's the inspiration and the purpose. Uh, we went through the, the framework and the structure and the tools that we used. Um, I think both of us would easily say this is one of our proudest professional accomplishments. The book, the day that we published the ebook, and we had a countdown online, and uh, you know we published the book at noon uh, on a Tuesday, I think it was, um, was just so exciting. And watching the hashtag, and watching the the padlets fill up, and watching the beautiful, beautiful videos that people posted on the Flipgrid, we really felt as though um, th this project was successful beyond our beyond our really our wildest dreams. Um, and we have a lot of people to thank for that. Um, all we did was really come up with a structure and coordinate it. Um, we were just so pleased with the response that we got and the quality of the participation that we had. Um, participants were so enthusiastic. If you go and just um, Google, if you learned here, you'll find blog posts and tweets, um, people sharing with their own school communities how excited they are and proud they are to be connecting with people around the world. Um, and the creativity of, of our um, participants really blew us away. We've got some beautiful sort of reflection videos and videos taken um, flying over a playground with a drone so that we could get an, a bird's eye view of their school playground. Um, so it's just been a joy to work on this and we're so looking forward to um, round two, aren't we Carolyn? Oh, absolutely. We are um, actively, I'm noticing some comments in the chat that people are going to um, pass this along to your friends and colleagues around the world. We absolutely encourage you and welcome you and appreciate you doing that. Um, really, the, the project, because of the structure, we really feel like um, even though, no, I won't say no matter how large it gets because I guess I don't know what exactly that might mean. But, um, <laughs> but it is a structure that, that worked for us. It is a structure that we think by, by organizing it so carefully, I think within the limitations provided a lot of, a lot of opportunity for creativity and also a lot of um, room for expansion and for replicating this project. And so we are doing the project again. The project is starting uh, with teachers on January 18th, although we may be pushing that back by about a week. Um, we have heard from a few schools in New Zealand that they'll still be on summer break of all the um, things that are hard <laughs> to process when we're here in January in Chicago, you know, freezing our toes off. Um, but we're going to be starting up in January. Registration is open now through December 9th at our website, ifyoulearnedhere.weebly.com. We absolutely welcome people to, to join in the adventure and to join in our global community. As you can see from the videos in the Padlet, we had kids as young as kindergarten and we had high schoolers participate. And it really worked um, because, again, everyone had something to say about their school and community. The content wasn't overwhelming, so kids could really focus on sharing their own voices and also exploring their own curiosity and questioning through this project. So and both of us have ideas about um, replicating this project in other uh, formats, um, for example, um, within the United States or within your own state, um, depending on what content it is you want your students to focus on. And so, um, you know, we'd be happy to talk to you um, about using this framework in a different way if that appeals to you as well. So um, we'd love to open it up for questions if anyone has any. I saw Sue's comment that um, schools in Tasmania don't go back until February 1st. And so, again, one of the questions that we ask on our registration form is, are there holidays coming up within this project timeline that are going to cause a challenge for you? Last year, our project was done more uh, later in the spring here in the U.S., so we started, uh, didn't we start in March, Mary? Is that right? We started very late February. Right. Okay. And we, yeah. we ended up, so we ended up into April. running into a Yes, and there were a lot of spring holidays um, all around the world, which of course is really interesting to learn about. We have um, a break typically around Easter here in the States, but there were many other holidays that were so interesting. Um, but we, we decided to try to move it closer to the start of the year to try to eliminate the schedule conflict and challenges that those holidays face 
And then, of course, for some schools, they were approaching the end of their school year. And so um, we were able to work with people on an individual basis to make sure they could contribute maybe a week late or whatever it may be. Um, so we try to keep it as flexible as possible. Yeah, so a um, couple questions in the chat. Uh, how did we not let this monopolize our time? Well, we worked very hard to make sure that it was manageable for other people, but Carolyn and I kind of joked that this was our part-time job <laughs> for a while. <laughs> um, we did a lot of nighttime Google Hangouts. Um, and for U.S. schools, how does this fit into Common Core? Well, let us count the ways, right? Speaking, listening, reading, writing, um, the whole lot of digital media. Um, I think we could we could talk about that quite a bit. I don't think you'd have a stretch to um, say that we're meeting Common Core with this project. And then, oh, another question, Carolyn, uh, Lucy. Yeah, go ahead and, and you can talk about how we found all the schools. Sure. So um, we did a lot of tweeting, and so um, and we actually we did post online in the community for this wonderful conference. So thank you to Steve and Lucy for bringing together so many people around the world who have a passion for connecting kids um, globally through the use of technology and other means. So we did post in the Global Education Conference community, um, and the rest was was word of mouth via Twitter via professional connections that we have, Mary through her international librarians group, myself through the Apple Distinguished Educator community, and we really just reached out as, as wide as, as far and wide as we could. This year we're doing some um, cold call emailing to countries and areas of the world where we have not yet had participation, so I'm really curious to see how that pans out. I can't believe I'm the one sending spam, but I figure it's spam for a good cause, so maybe that doesn't really make it spam. Um, and I see in the chat, what countries are you looking for? We definitely did not have much representation. Um, I don't think we had any last year from the continent of Africa. Um, we had really strong participation from New Zealand and Australia, which we absolutely welcome. Um, and I just think generally, if you take a look at the map, um, if you take a look at the map on our, on our website, you will see the list of schools that we had. Um, we had a great showing from New Zealand and the U.S. And so we just would really like to diversify it to the greatest extent possible. Yes, it's Africa and South America that we're particularly looking for. We've asked our participants from last year to be ambassadors for the project. Um, we also had a, a large sort of proportion of our schools that were international schools um, so that they are in a particular country, but their students aren't all from that country. They may be um, the children of people who are working in that country. Um, and we've asked them to help us connect with uh, local schools, perhaps, to, um, you know, get a different perspective as well. So, yeah. Um, oh, we did have a question about did schools sign up and not participate? Well, yes. <laughs> we did have that. Um, and we had... We had people who signed up but didn't participate, but we also had people who signed up and then would email us and say, boy, you know, we really are so excited about this, but we're going to be a week late on this and that. And um, we always were very, very supportive um, of that to say, you know, post when you can. Uh, the only really firm deadline we ended up having was the, the publication date for the book. Um, we did, and we did extend to that for a week once we realized about all the spring vacations. So we're, again, you know, kind of funneling that back into our planning for this coming year. Yes, and I think that, um, you know, some people, when we, we reached out again to last year's participants to let them know that we were opening the project for a second year, and we received some emails that almost, I don't want to say they had sort of like, like a guilty tone, but almost people coming sheepishly and saying, um, well, we tried last year, we couldn't fit it in, but we really want to make a go at it again this year. I mean, we're busy teachers too. We totally get it. We do want people to commit and to participate, but this is somewhere where the, the cohort system really kind of gave us a nice buffer in a way because, you know, everybody had a group that had significant enough participation to maintain its own momentum. And then they also had access to everybody else as well. And so it wasn't as dependent on any one individual. It wasn't like we were sort of passing the baton from country to country and it could get stuck somewhere. It was a, almost a, like a video bulletin board and then a multimedia bulletin board. And I, I think in the finished book, am I correct that we had 40 countries in the finished book or 40 schools, Mary? That's is that right? right? 
Yeah, that sounds about right. All right. And any other questions, closing thoughts? I'll jump I just want to thank you and, oh. and say one thing too. Um, your your thoughts about finding other schools. One thing that I think Iron can probably help you with is is connecting with schools and you know real everyday schools in all parts of the world. You know the international school world is pretty well resourced and you know not necessarily on the ground in the countries that they're in. So that might be kind of an interesting perspective. And then I also was thinking of Valerie Becker, who is another Apple Distinguished Educator, who is now retired but taught in Martha's Vineyard. And she would do things, she would do these great projects like whaling around the world because Martha's Vineyard used to be a whaling community and they would investigate it. And she'd go looking all over for schools that were in whaling communities, which you can imagine is pretty rare now. Um, but she found schools in Japan and she found schools in Iceland and places like that, and they did some projects. Um, and they also did lighthouses around the world, too, and they studied that as a local and global kind of thing. Um, but what wow. she did was she did a lot of legwork. She went digging around various communities, including taking it global, and our community looking for specific people and then ma emailing them. So if you do want to go into the Global Education Conference and search for the country that you're specifically targeting, you might find some people in there. We have about 170 countries represented. Some of them are only like one or two people. <laughs> but you may be pleasantly surprised if you, um, if you make a plug to specific people in the community. We've also had graduate students who are studying education in other parts of the world, and they've gone in and, and left comments for people and, and have gotten some responses. So I just wanted to add that. Okay, great. Yeah, and I think, I, you know, I, I think that um, I noticed a comment about how different it is to work with the international schools versus schools um, that are, are, for lack of a better word, native to that country or, you know, to work, to work with a school that's an international school in Germany versus a school that's in a town um, in Germany that is with, you know, populated with German students. And so one thing we did try this year is to invite our international school participants to reach out to somebody nearby and say, okay, your international school in, um, in Bombay or in um, Switzerland has been such an incredible part of our online community. Could you find somebody local as well to join in? And we just think that would add, you know, some different voices and some different perspectives. Um, and in terms of what you were saying, Lucy, about um, Valerie's projects about the whaling and the lighthouses, this is one of the things that we love about the, tw the, the sort of trio of tools we had going, the Flipgrid, the Padlet, and the Book Creator. We feel like we could take this suite of tools and this general approach and apply it to so many different content areas. We thought about doing that for year two and saying, well, maybe we need a different theme and we want to do a different kind of focus this year. Um, but as people were noting, it's pretty time consuming to kind of get this off the ground. And we felt like we had enough refinement that we wanted to make after year one that we're like, no, we love this theme. It was very successful. Let's go with this for another year. But we are interested in, in seeing what other kind of maybe more specific avenues that we could go into um, in terms of being able to share using these tools. It's a pretty it's a pretty replicable and manageable model, we think. So just to to give you some more food for thought, we have another keynote this week and I think they're on Wednesday, but I could be wrong. Everything's kind of a blur for me right now. Um, a guy named Henry Harbo from Luminid is going to be keynoting with his managing director in India. And Luminid, um, Henry's actually a former student of mine who just graduated from Oberlin and happened to join this community a year ago at another teacher, uh, another teacher's recommendation. And that teacher actually participated in your project, I think. Anyway, um, Henry and his friends invented a box that will connect classrooms um, through video conferencing and will also serve as a projector. I haven't seen it in person, but it's a pretty cool device. And the idea is that a school here buys the device for themselves and for a school abroad, usually in India. And then they can do video pen pal uh, exchanges. So you, might, you guys might be interested in going and hearing their spiel. 
and thinking about maybe not this year, but maybe next year, how maybe you can incorporate something different into the classroom and they could, you know, maybe you guys could partner with them somehow to do a, a, a you know, a significant project of some sort. That's one of the ideas, um, Lucy, that we had talked about is um, trying to figure out if we could somehow fund a school's participation. Um, we had a school in Africa who wanted to join us last year, but they said, honestly, we don't even have access to the print book, let alone, uh, you know, the digital tools. Um, and so we were thinking about, could we crowdsource some funds to sponsor a school to participate on that kind of thing? So that sounds like something we should uh, explore, Luminad. Great. Well, it looks like we're just about at the end of the hour. Uh, everybody has your contact information and can follow up with you afterwards. And thank you so, so much for this. This has been a tremendous um, presentation, and I think this sets the bar for everybody in terms of designing projects. I like this because um, if you're at the level where you're just starting out, this is a great opportunity for people to join and, and learn from your leadership. And then if you're at the stage where you feel comfortable designing your own project, I think you can incorporate some of the principles that you outlined so nicely here tonight for us. So kudos to you both. It's been amazing. I hope you apply for lots of awards through ISTE and whatnot because you certainly deserve it. It's really been a joy to see happen. So thank you again. Thanks for inviting us. We're just really honored to be here tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's been, uh, it's been an adventure and we feel like we're just at the beginning. So can't wait for year two. All right. Goodbye.